Hello there, I'm Unstable Voltage and you have just watched the campaign trailer for Phoenix Point. Just before I continue, I would like to fully disclose that I do know the developer personally. I worked with him on his previous title, Chaos Reborn, in helping to advertise and promote it. And while this video is not a paid promotion, you should consider that my opinion is most likely going to be biased. Today I have with me the CEO of Snapshot Games and the creator of Phoenix Point, Julian Gollop. Hello. Hi Julian, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you? I'm not too bad at all. So we are here to talk about Phoenix Point, but before we get into that, for those people who may not know, why don't you just go through a list of some of the other games that you have worked on in the past? Oh my goodness, that's quite a long list. I mean, the first games I worked on were on the ZX Spectrum back in the early 80s, like uh, Nebula, Rebel Star Raiders... Rebel Star, then Laser Squad, which is really a precursor to XCOM uh, UFO Defense, also known as UFO Enemy Unknown in Europe, which was my, you know, obviously my biggest title and major inspiration for Phoenix Point. Um, I then worked on something called Magic Mayhem, Laser Squad Nemesis. Uh, I made a bunch of things at Ubisoft, including Ghost Recon Shadow Wars before finally um, going to Kickstarter with Chaos Reborn, which we released in 2015. So that's quite an impressive list of titles over almost 40 years of development. Y yes, yes, <laughs> it's a long time. And um, you did mention in there XCOM as being probably your most well-known work, and as you said, it is a big inspiration for Phoenix Point. Yes, it is. I mean, XCOM was an evolution of some of the early games I made. You know, some I mentioned Rebel Star, Rebel Star Raiders, LA Squad, um, and it was released by Microprose in 1994, and it was followed up by Terror from the Deep and XCOM Apocalypse, and then there were a series of games after that which did not bear much relation to the sort of tactical strategic gameplay of the original XCOM series. But it was kind of... Um, I guess, fallen into disuse until Firaxis revived the XCOM brand with XCOM Money Enemy Unknown in 2012. Now, Phoenix Point has actually just launched its crowdfunding campaign over today on fig.co. Yes, we've just launched it and we are looking for $500,000 to finish the game. We've been working on it for just over a year now. Um, and we want to step up our production efforts, particularly on the art and content side, uh, to get a release towards the end of next year. So as you've just said, the game has been sort of worked on for almost a year now, if not just over a year, I think I first remember hearing it mentioned back in March of last year. Yeah. And information on the game has been quite secretive uh, up to this point. And I'm sure people have a lot of questions about the game and what it's going to include. I know I myself have got quite a few, so hopefully today we're going to be able to answer some of those questions for people. Um, but if people are interested uh, in going and having a look at the campaign, there will be a link in the description below the video over to the FIG campaign. And also to um, phoenixpoint.info, the official website, where you can sign up to the newsletter to get regular updates. Yeah, sure. Um... And, of course, we'll be following uh, the launch with regular updates on fig.co as well. And I hope there's also some coverage in the press and some more um, videos for you to watch. Excellent. So hopefully lots of content going forwards. So you've kindly provided me with a press pack. Uh, we've got some interesting slides in there, some little teasers and bits of information. I'm going to go through uh, some of these slides and uh, hopefully you can fill in some of the blanks for me. Sure, go ahead. So the very first thing I'm looking at when I open your press pack here is I have a HP Lovecraft quote. <laughs> so yes. can you sort of explain what Lovecraft has to do with Phoenix Point? Yes, what does Lovecraft mean to me? Yes, I I think the, the most basic answer is that Phoenix Point really is a sci-fi horror game in the sense that we have this all-pervading cosmic horror uh, which 
not only regards human beings as utterly insignificant, but could potentially wipe out the human race uh, in, a, in a blink of an eye. So it has that pervasive sense of doom. And um, the setting of the game, although it's in the future, it still follows a very Lovecraftian style uh, approach to, to the horror. There are things that are unknown. There are strange cults that worship alien gods, which um, may or may not be large creatures existing somewhere in the universe. Um, and there is an element of mystery also to the Phoenix organization, which he must delve into the past as well as the present in order to discover the origins of the of the Phoenix project itself. Um, there is uh, a lot of monsters with uh, tentacles and hideous mutations. So, I mean, that it certainly fits within Lovecraft's um, horror where many of his... Uh, imaginings are completely sort of alien type creatures which bear little relation to to life on earth um one thing we have done is update the i guess the science behind it because uh, lovecraft himself was always uh one who tried to keep abreast of the latest developments in science but of course he was writing in the 1930s so to bring lovecraft up to date we need to incorporate the science of the 21st century and we're looking at specifically the idea of Pandora viruses, different types of evolution, how mutagens can actually rapidly mutate DNA sequences through RNA manipulation and how global warming might impact the development of such viruses and how the sea itself is full of viruses and microbes um, and, and so on. Now XCOM itself had somewhat of a story but it was more of a framework for the player to actually build their own adventure on but it sounds like phoenix point is going to have uh, a bit more artistic story behind it yes it does and we've got an excellent writing team on board with uh Giannis Kirazis, who worked on talus principle and alan stroud who worked with us on chaos reborn and also on elite dangerous novelization um and what we're trying to do here is create uh, a fairly sophisticated um world where there are a number of different factions which have their own ideologies and technology and history and their secrets they have leaders and characters which um, have their own personalities and relationships there is a backstory a history to the phoenix project as well as what happened during the the course of the next 10 20 30 years uh, where the alien virus begins to take over the earth and um, there will be many more story elements included in just individual missions that you go on. You know, there'll be much more um, of an interesting sort of uh, objectives that are given to the player based on event stories and characters in the game. Now, if people want a little bit of a taste of that, I believe there are a couple of short stories over on uh, phoenixpoint.info. Yes, we're going to be releasing much more fiction during the course of the campaign, and if you want a little bit of backstory about the world of Phoenix Point, it's a great place to start. So once again, link to that will be in the description below the video. So I've just flicked over to the next slide, and I don't want to talk too much about everything that's on this slide, because a lot of it is covered later on in the pack, but uh, the very first thing that stands out to me is Phoenix Point is a strategy game about defeating an alien threat. So I have to ask the question, are we looking at an alien invasion again like XCOM? It's not aliens in the same sense as XCOM, because the uh, Pandora virus, which is a type of virus with a huge genome, has been dormant on Earth for a, a number of years, uh, quite a long time, and you don't know how long it'll start with the game. And the aliens actually start from a very low-tech uh, origin, but they're able to rapidly mutate creatures and incorporate the DNA of human beings, and that leads them to a higher level of sentience and consciousness, which enables them to use technology and actually steal technology directly from you. Um, so it's kind of a reverse of the traditional XCOM story where you start off fighting a superior technology, in this case, you start with the superior technology, uh, but the aliens are rapidly advancing. So that is quite different. In XCOM, it always felt that at the beginning of the game, you were very much on the back foot, but it almost felt like the player became overpowered towards the end of the campaign. Yes. So um, the story, as it unfolds, will be somewhat different. Um, most of humanity has been wiped out. This is the problem, that the uh, the human population is 
very small and you know civilization is wiped out as we know it and people are existing in very isolated uh, settlements and havens and in a way you're fighting a losing battle against a huge biomass the simple you know quantity and and, um, and mass of alien creatures and microbes and stuff uh, which have completely dominated the sea and now starting to come and encroach upon the land in large numbers means that you are facing overwhelming um, force in that sense but not overwhelming in the sense of the technology right so let's have a discussion about the game pillars because this is going to be the meat and potatoes of the game now i assume that most people have probably had experience if not with xcom but with one of the games very similar to it that has the strategic layer and the sort of tactical battles but can you explain a little bit about how the two synergize together yes so the strategic layer is presented very much similar to the original XCOM, you have a sort of geoscape, which is a rotatey, spinny, zoomy worldview. And in this worldview, you can see all of the human settlements, all of the detected aliens, and um, all of your bases, uh, different aircraft which are flown by different factions. And you see the mist, also alien mist encroaching along on the land. And this is all your strategic view. And the um, world is very dynamic in the sense that the the factions are doing their own thing the aliens are doing their own thing and in this world you have to intervene and interact with other factions as well as fight aliens and of course a lot of that intervention does involve tactical turn-based missions so for example you may have a request from a haven to help uh, defend it against uh, an alien attack you can dispatch a squad to to help them if you succeed, you will be rewarded in some way by that haven, depending on what resources they've got. Um, there are other things that could happen, like you could get involved in a war between the factions. You may have an alliance with one, you need to help defend them against the other. You may also be attacked, your bases may be raided or um, and assaulted by both aliens and other human factions. And all of these incidents will result in these tactical battles. And the interaction between the tactical and the strategic is very important. Often you're fighting for very specific objectives, which will help you in some way at the strategic level of the game. Uh, you know, it could be diplomatic effects as well as gaining resources or pushing back aliens and so on. Excellent. Now, looking at the same slide, I also noticed the addition of role playing and Obviously in XCOM you had the ability to name your soldiers and you could give them varying bits of equipment and their stats did improve over time as they went mm -hmm. on missions and sort of went up in rank. But what is the difference going to be moving into Phoenix Point? Well, the difference is that the, the soldiers and characters that you recruit will have their own little backstory. They will often come from the other factions. So, for example, if you um, defend... A haven or temple site belonging to the disciples of Anu. You may get a volunteer for your forces who happens to be maybe, maybe she was um, being groomed to the priest class in inside the cult. So she'll have a little backstory. She'll have some skills and abilities which are based on that faction's uh, strengths, um, and she'll obviously have certain types of dress and armor which come from that that faction background. Um, and these characters, you can then develop them in a different direction, of course. You can train them up in the Phoenix Project uh, uh, methods of fighting and so on. And you have these a combination of cultures and, and um, technologies uh, which you draw on from the, from the outside world. So they're not just anonymous soldiers that you, you recruit. Um, you do, of course, have the ability to rename them, customize them to, to whatever extent you, you like, as in all of the XCOM games past and present. Um, but then that's entirely up to the player. Does like to give people a sense of attachment to uh, those characters to try and keep them alive a little bit longer on the battlefield? Yeah, absolutely. This has always been a strong part of the XCOM games, of course, that you are nurturing your soldiers and developing them training them giving them nice weapons and nice armor and ultimately seeing them die in the battlefield and never never seeing them again the and of the game 
of course, you've once you've got a, a character that has gained certain skills and abilities and started to level up, it's more important to keep them alive because you don't want to be doing end game missions with a, a, a team That's of noobs, right. really. Yeah, you do want to keep them alive, um, but then again, you need to use them as well. So it's a risk kind of reward balance that you have to constantly assess as you're going through the game. So now let's touch on what is probably one of the most unique features uh, of Phoenix Point in this sort of genre of game, and that is the not only procedural monsters, but huge procedural monsters, sort of boss battles yes. almost. Yes, uh, boss battles are a big feature, and the game mechanics are engineered to reflect how these boss battles uh, are carried out. One of the important things you need to do is when you're tackling a monster, you, you often need to target a specific part of its body in order to disable it in some way, and usually this will disable one of its abilities or slow it down or prevent its attacks. And these monsters are sort of multifunctional, multi-role um, combat units, if you like. Um, some of them will be able to eject mist in the battlefield, which allows them to uh, operate under cover of that mist. Uh, some will be spawning larvae during the course of it, which will run around and attack you and infect you. They may have multiple methods of attack, including um, various types of weaponry that might be attached to their bodies. Um, and they go through several stages of um, uh, behavior as their um, as their health is whittled down. So that's broadly speaking how they work. Um, but the mutation aspect is also very interesting because the monsters and actually all the aliens will develop um, in different ways depending on what weapons and what tactics you're using against them. And they will mutate if they are losing. Um, if they're winning with a particular mutation, then they will deploy more of it. So the the aliens are going to react to the tactics of the player, and then, as the player, you then have to sort of work against the tactics of the aliens. Yes, that's right. It's kind of almost like a dynamic difficulty thing in a way, because the the aliens are generally um, happy to to keep producing the same mutations as as long as they're being successful. Um, eventually, the player will figure out how to deal with it or develop a technology that can cope with a particular type of alien and that will result in the player becoming victorious on the battlefield and it will force the aliens into doing some mutations to try and experiment with some some new types of, um, of forces and there's a random a aspect to it I mean the, the aliens will try a few random mutations and see if they work uh, if they do produce more of them if they don't the mutation process continues so it's also going to give the game a, a little bit more replayability and that every time you play it you may run into different variations of the aliens. That's right, yeah. So each player will um, eventually have a different set of uh, aliens based on his particular playstyle and um, preferences compared to other players. Now obviously one thing that's going to be very important is the AI of the aliens. I know that you sent a survey out recently to people who had signed up for information on the Phoenix Point website, and I believe it was actually the the most requested feature was to have a, a highly adaptable alien AI. Yes, interestingly. This is something that people thought was the most important thing out of all of the things that we put in our survey, is to have a good AI. Um, I couldn't agree more, I really do think it's very important. But of course it's not just about having the cleverest AI, it's about having an AI that has a personality and, and, and creates interesting situations for the player to um, try and counter. So there will be an adaptive AI. Um, we already have it sort of mostly working and it's already pretty good to play against. Um, so I'm pretty optimistic that we'll be able to meet players' expectations as far as that goes. Now, you did mention when talking about the boss fights that as the player you have the ability to target individual body parts on the aliens. And the sort of mechanics that you describe, I do recall back to the original XCOM that you could get injured in various body parts even though you couldn't aim at them specifically. Yes, you could, yes. And you had a sort of medikit that could heal and stop bleeding in certain parts of the body. And um, yeah, we have something very similar now in Phoenix Point. Um, 
and you know disabling body parts for, even for your soldiers has a very significant impact you know, if you get injured leg you're going to be um, significantly reduced in your walking speed if you injure an arm you might not be able to use a two-handed weapon uh, if you injure your head your perception will be reduced and so on so uh, these are all important effects um, but more interesting is probably trying to figure out what the different body parts and the aliens do and how and which ones we're trying to find out what the weakness is uh, in the aliens and try and exploit it ruthlessly Excellent. Well, I think you actually answered my next question there, was, which was going to be, can the aliens target specific body parts on your soldiers? <laughs> yes, they can, yes. Absolutely. So, so it definitely does work both ways. Well, that's a good yep. thing to know. So going through on to the next slide, and uh, we've got a whole slide here dedicated to the alien mist. Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned it a couple of times, that it sort of rises from the sea, and there are certain aliens, particularly bosses, that can spread the mist around. So... Can yep. you elaborate a little bit more about what the mist actually is and what it does? Yeah, so it operates in two levels. It's at the strategic level, the, str the mist is generated by um, the microbes in the sea. So it's an airborne microbial mist, but it's kind of semi-intelligent as well. So it can be used to direct and communicate uh, between aliens. And in the tactical battles, the mist is used to um, provide cover for the aliens and also a means to communicate and stimulate them especially if there's a boss monster around and if any of your soldiers are caught in a mist you'll be immediately detected and you also suffer some uh, some adverse effects um, so you have to think of ways to deal with it ways to clear out the mist or ways to avoid it or ways to stop it being generated by um, whatever mist generators are in the tactical battle at the time and it, it basically presents an interesting uh, challenge to the player. It's like a very deadly fog of war. Yes, exactly. A dynamic, intelligent, deadly fog of war. <laughs> so we apparently are going to have interactive procedural environments. So procedural environments are nothing new if you've played the original XCOM, because I believe the vast majority of them are all procedurally generated. Yes. Yeah, so this will be very similar to the way it's done in old and new XCOMs alike. Um, the battlefields are generated based on uh, various types of installations and templates, uh, many variations thereof. Uh, the difference probably with Phoenix Point is that each haven or you know, each site or each base um, will generate a battlefield based on the actual sort of facilities and structures that are being constructed there by that faction. So you know that if you go to the um, capital um, city or town or base of the New Jericho um, faction, that they will have a big fortress there. They will have a number of you know factories and weapons factories and other installations. Um, uh, so there, there's that more dynamic relationship between the strategic and the tactical. I think one of the things that disappointed a lot of people in the Firaxis XCOM. Uh, was even during the base invasion, which only happened if you bought some extra DLC for it, was that it was just a sort of pre-generated, pre-designed base and didn't in any way resemble uh, the actual base that you'd created in the game. Right, right. So is Phoenix Point going more the direction of the original XCOM where you can customise and build your own base and that is will be reflected in the tactical battle? Yes, you got that exactly right. So the layout of your base, which you construct at the strategic level, will determine the layout of the battlefield when your base gets attacked. So yes, much much like the original XCOM. Fantastic. I'm sure people will be more than happy to have that back in there. I know that I definitely am. Uh, now, that slide is also showing a nice big explosion. So the question is, can you blow everything up on these maps? Uh, not everything. It depends on how strong these structures actually are. So some uh, types of structure, like shanty towns that a lot of people live in, will be very easily destructible. Um, you know, fortresses and other hard points and temples and stuff will be much, much stronger. Um, but the destructibility is still a very important part of the uh, tactics and strategy. And uh, if you want to use the destruction approach, you will be able to destroy large parts of the map. There will, of course, be downsides to this that you, you may 
place in danger civilians there may be certain things that you want to capture some bits of technology or resources which you could be destroyed of course by uh, using lots of explosives um, so yeah again there are upsides and downsides but I, I do want it to be a more viable strategy than than in say the modern XCOMs and XCOM 2 in particular although it had a nice destructible environment system uh, I still found it rather difficult to destroy very much even if I had a squad um, full of grenadiers and maxed out with you know other explosive weapons yes I know again that it was one of the more highly rated things in the survey that people wanted the fully destructible terrains where you could actually level entire buildings mm -hmm. instead of just blowing little holes in walls absolutely and uh, you also mentioned on this slide something about the strategic points and tactics cards can you explain a little bit about those Ah, right, so tactics cards, these are basically like battlefield abilities which you normally have to research or you can acquire from other factions and they will give you um, sort of squad level buffs uh, like revealing um, deployment locations of enemies, revealing their resource locations, giving you some extra um, sight ranges at the beginning, um, potentially giving certain classes of, of soldiers some extra buffs, extra mobility or uh, so on and other types of tactics cards are um, sort of off battlefield abilities um, such as calling in weapon strikes and airstrikes from other vehicles um, or other calling in evacuation um, zones to to get your squad out or to get civilians out of an area and so on. Excellent. Uh, now, obviously, we talked about the role-playing aspects and sort of uh, leveling up characters and customizing characters. But uh, in Phoenix Point, you're going to have uh, extensive uh, customization, which is going to be abilities and equipment, but also uh, cosmetic upgrades as well. Uh, yes, sure. You'll have plenty of cosmetic upgrades for your uh, soldiers, including different types of clothing, tattoos, hairstyles, and so on. Much following the the model which was developed in XCOM 2, which was obviously very good, um, and that will allow you to even more identify and personalise your your soldiers. And uh, are these things going to be sort of unlocked from the beginning of the game, or are they going to yes. be things that you have to require? Uh, well, actually, yeah, that's a good good point. Um, uh, a lot of these customizations are unlocked when you recruit um, personnel from the different factions. So, um, if you want some of the uh, sort of Sinedron, which is one of the factions, you want some of their style of clothing and um, decorations, and as well as their technology, you will have to start recruiting people from their faction. So all of these cosmetic options are going to be available to anybody who has the game. They're not going to be yeah. microtransactions and things like that. Uh, no, not going to be microtransactions. So I'm looking now at the Geoscape, and uh, it's come quite a long way since 1994. It's certainly evolved a bit. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the Geoscape is, is much more interactive and dynamic sort of entity than it was before. Um, in a way, the game is a little bit more forexy in the sense that the different factions and different havens all are doing their own thing. They're building structures, building facilities, taking over bases, having diplomatic relationships with each other. Each haven has its own leader with its own personality. Each faction has its own leader with its own personality. Um, and you will be doing a lot of interaction with these NPCs. Um, a, a lot of it will be in the form of negotiating in terms of diplomacy and things that they want from you, uh, things you might want from them, and so on. Um, so it has, um, you know, more dynamic feel to it. I mean, even if you as a player just did nothing and watched what was going on in the world, events would happen, things would happen. The the different factions all have their own. Um, objectives and plan to deal with the alien menace which may or may not succeed um, again you can intervene to help them uh, or you can intervene to fight them and steal their stuff um, so yeah it's a much more involved and dynamic world than what I've attempted previously in some ways actually it's it's kind of um, inspired by XCOM Apocalypse even though that game was set within the confines of a single city it did have these elements of different organizations 
um, criminal gangs and religious cults and so on that all had their own resources and, and di diplomatic relationships with each other, um, which could result in some very interesting situations. And um, we're expanding this, I guess, on a world scale and now using the Geoscape as your main view. And um, I think this is one of the more exciting things about Phoenix Point, which we are currently developing. So the world's kind of just progressing on without you and you've got different factions with their own agendas and mm -hmm. you can mess around with them and interfere, but yeah. ultimately they're just getting on with it and doing their own thing. Exactly. So you've mentioned diplomacy in there um, and the yeah. fact that you can both defend factions, uh, faction havens against aliens, but you can also defend them against the infighting from other factions. Yes, so this is important. Um, if you want to make a formal alliance with a faction, you, this will carry obligations, so you will be obliged to defend their havens where possible, uh, probably as part of that alliance. Um, and again, if they're attacked by another faction, you'll be required to help them rather than the other faction. Um, the benefits of such alliances mean that you will get access to their technology and some resources, which will be very useful. And you can maintain that alliance as long as you want, or you can um, abandon it and start attacking them. It's entirely up to you. One thing will, will be very difficult is to to maintain uh, maintain an alliance with all of the all of the factions, which will be very very tricky because they will come into conflict with each other, and you will ultimately have to to pick sides in that that instance. So again, that sounds to me like a perfect opportunity for multiple playthroughs because you may play the game through once, siding with one faction, and then in your next playthrough decide to go down another route. Yeah, exactly, and may result in different endings to the game as well because each faction has their own particular solution to the alien menace which you can um, help them with. and. Um, as well as pursuing your own um, agenda, which is discovering what happened to the Phoenix Project and you know what happened in uh, previous historical examples of you know what happened you know, with aliens, for example. Um, I, yeah, so you can actually pursue um, uh, one of the objectives, that one of the solutions that one of the, these factions have, either with or without their assistance. It's entirely up to you. Excellent. So it's quite uh, quite an exciting twist there that we might actually see different endings to the game. I think that'll be something uh, that the Dexcom was severely lacking. It was always yeah. leading to the same conclusion. Yeah, exactly. So the game is currently being developed for PC, uh, for Windows, uh, Mac and Linux. Uh, funnily enough, I seem to recall on the survey that requests for a console port were, I think, the, the lowest requested feature. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a shame in some ways, but of course we, we have to focus on, on where most players are, are playing these kind of games, which is, is absolutely definitely on PC. Yeah, of course, that's fine. And that isn't to say that further down the line, if the game is successful, there may not be a console port. Yeah, it won't be. It, we won't be focusing on a console version the for, for the launch of the no. game, no, not at all. But we're looking at a launch of oh, the last sort of half of next year. Um, yeah, so yeah, be quarter four, uh, 2018. And uh, what sort of point in the development cycle is uh, Phoenix Point at at the moment? Well, we have uh, a pretty comprehensive uh, design and concept for uh, a, a lot of the game. We have a working tactical battle system uh, with AI, which is working rather nicely. We are in the middle of implementing the main sort of monster boss fight system. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to show some of that before the end of our campaign. And we are in parallel uh, working on the Geoscape side of the game and you know the basic um, interaction and resource um, system for the uh, factions and Phoenix Point. Um, the, G the strategic and tactical are not interacting with each other yet so we've still got a long way to go there. And we've got a huge amount of content to um, put in, including all the different environment types, all the different character types and alien types. So, uh, yeah, there's still a lot of work to do. Excellent. So while, as you say, there is a lot of work to do, you've also put in a substantial amount of time and effort on the game so far. There's definitely, uh, definitely things in motion already. Yes, absolutely. 
So if anyone is interested in going and taking a look at the uh, FIG campaign, and maybe even back in the game for yourself, as I said, the link will be in the description below the video. Uh, once again, a big thank you to Julian for popping by to answer some of these questions, and hopefully if we get any more questions, we can put them to him in a future video. Uh, yeah, I'll be happy to answer any more questions. Um, yeah, don't forget to, to put your comments in the uh, campaign page itself and I will do my best to answer anything that you've got to ask there. Okay, thanks very much Julian. Thank you. And thank you to you guys for watching. I'll see you on the next video and until then, goodbye for now.